we're going to worship Jesus. I want to read uh, first here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. God is one, and he is uh, always communicating. He has revealed himself with his people through scripture, and so we're going to open the word together today. We're going to sing songs of truth about who he is and his character and his relation to us, and so we're going to do that together. And let's first profess our need and dependence on him.
sound beautiful this morning, and I know that the Father is pleased by the praises of his people when we lift our voice and we, we sing to him about him and the truth of who he is. Um, I want to read in John 2, 9 through 11 for us. Who read the chapter this week? Show of hands, show of hands, that's awesome. Um, so in, in John 2, you would have read, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What I wanna draw our attention to this morning is the manifested his glory. What does it mean that Jesus manifested his glory that took me to this week, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Um, and really, Exodus 33 and 34 uh, is this whole interaction of, of God's conversation with God and Moses and this back and forth. And at one point, Moses says, please show me your glory, God. He asks that God would show him his glory. And God defines his glory for Moses. He, he refers to it as all of his goodness all of his goodness. He said, I'm going to pass all my goodness in front of you. You're not going to be able to see my face. I'm going to shield you with my hand because if you see my face, you'll die. But I'll show you all my goodness. Uh, and so jumping ahead a little bit, um, there's this encounter. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Yahweh defines his glory as all his goodness. It's characterized by his abounding steadfast love and his faithfulness. That is who he is, and, and he manifested his glory before Moses. And, and back to Jesus in the New Testament, Mary, the reason he turned water into wine is, is why. His mother asked him, made a request of him, will you do this? And he said, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. But Jesus responds to that, from a request and he manifests his glory, he does something in response to. And, and when we encounter the glory of God in the same way Moses, in the same way his disciples after says they believed, Moses fell down and worshiped. That was the response. The disciples, they were in awe and they believed and they followed him and pursued him. And so when we encounter the goodness of God, the glory of God, the mercy, the steadfast love and faithfulness of God, we respond. And so that's what we're doing this morning. God has spoken and, and he continues to speak. And so we are seeking him to fix our eyes on him. And we're responding to his mercy, his kindness, his faithfulness. And we're going to continue doing that.
simple, so would you join me and sing this? Oh Christ, be the center of our lives, be the place we fix our eyes, be the center of our lives. That's it. Oh Christ, be the center. Above them all, in the angels. 
respond to all your goodness to your faithfulness to your kindness the grace that has been lavished on us the sacrifice you made so that we could be reconciled to you once and for all Lord would we lean on your promises this morning wherever we are knowing that you meet us exactly where we are your God who came down to us to seek us out, not because of our worth, but because of yours. We praise your name this morning. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, Story City. We are so glad you are here this morning. We are going to transition into our minutes to mingle, so this is the time for you to Say hi to someone you don't know or someone you do know. If you're, or if you're an introvert, you know, you can go out to the lobby, you can get an extra cup of coffee, or you can use the restroom at any time. Unfortunately, we don't have a question for you, so. take a seat. I know you could do it all morning. I love it. I just want to say hello. My name is Kat. I just want to give a special welcome. If you're a first timer here, we're just super happy you're here. I got to meet a couple under the tent on the way in. Oh, the blinking lights. I love it. Um, so if you are a first timer here, please find people in these hot pink lanyards. We hang out under the tent in the walkway. And if you want any more information or to get plugged in, we've got that for you. Also, if you just wanna scan 
a QR code. There's a card in the seat back pocket in front of you that will also get you some more information and plugged in, or you can go old school and fill it out and just drop it off in those black giving boxes in the back. And if you don't wanna do any of those things this morning, we're still just super happy you're here. Um, mentioning the offering boxes transitions me into a time of worship through giving. So at Story City, we lock, like to talk about the why behind giving. We say that um, all of worship is about giving away. So whether that's giving away our song in praise, our time in service, or in financial offering. Um, so just a quick three ways you can do it. If you are wanting to give today, if you are a first time or new, please feel no obligation. This is for people who call Story City their home. But if you would like to give today, there is the Church Center app. It's quick and easy. I love that way. There is an option to open a full browser if you want to do that. StoryCityChurch.com forward slash giving. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> You can also go old school and put it in the back. And now I would love to just pray for us. Lord, you are so good. You are our provider, Jehovah Jireh. And I just love that verse where you talk about every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down for the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. We just thank you for all the gifts you give us, Lord, and the constant that you are in our life. We praise you for who you are and who that makes us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if you can, please stand up for the reading of the Word of God with me. I'm going to read in English, followed by Hindi. How's that? Good. Yeah, all right. After this, he went down to Capernaum, together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they stayed, where, and they stayed there only a few days. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves. And he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. I'm going to switch to Hindi. Iske baad Masih Yeshu, unki mata, unke bhai, tatha unke shishya kuch dino ke liye, kafarnuhum nagar chale gaye. Jab Yehudiyon ka fasa utsav paas aya, to Masih Yeshu apne shishyon ke saath Yerushalem gaye. उन्होंने मंदिर में बैल भेड़ और कबूतर बेचने वालों तथा साहूकारों को व्यापार करते हुए पाया इसलिए उन्होंने रस्सियों का एक कोड़ा बनाया और उन सब को बैलों और भेड़ों सहित मंदिर से बाहर निकाल दिया और साहूकारों के सिक्के बिखेर दिए उनकी चौकियों को उलट दिया और कबूतर बेचने वालों से कहा इन्हें यहां से ले जाओ मेरे पिता के भवन को व्यापारिक केंद्र मत बनाओ यह सुन शिष्यों को पवित्र शास्त्र का यह लेख याद आया आपके भवन की धुन में जलते जलते मैं भस्म हुआ दिस इज द वर्ड ऑफ द लॉर्ड ऑल राइट गुड मॉर्निंग चर्च हाउ डू टुडे yeah. Hey, my name is Justin. I have the honor and privilege to serve as one of your pastors here. And I love seeing your guys' beautiful faces this morning. So thank you for being here. 
I'm excited to open up God's word. I'm excited to be able to walk through and see what God has for us this morning. I love walking in and, uh, and a lot of you guys are dropping ping pong balls into the little space to be able to say that we're reading John together. I love that we're doing something uh, together. It's not only exciting that as we're doing this challenge to, to read through John in the next uh, 21 weeks, but also like, it, so not only is it good for me to remember like, oh, I need to read John this week so, so I can put in a ping pong ball, uh, but then also because it lets me know I'm not alone in doing this. And so it's cool walking by and just knowing being able to be a part of something that's bigger and greater. And so, um, so it's exciting that we get to do something all together. Right now we're in a series entitled uh, The Depth and Restoration of Christ as we go through the book of John. And, uh, and, and as we go through John, we, we're, we're spending time each week uh, being able to, to read through the chapter. And then we get to kind of culminates to what we get to do here on a Sunday morning as we dig in deeper into a section, section of scripture. And one of the reasons why it's this, this pursuit, it's this depth and restoration of Christ through the book of John is because it kind of helps maybe to know uh, you know, every gospel is kind of written with a, with a perspective, with a lens. Each author is writing with a sense of purpose or trying to accomplish something that's a little bit different. In fact, that's why there's four gospels kind of telling the same story, uh, but it's, kind of, it's diff from different perspectives, highlighting different uh, purposes or reasons, trying to get us to understand, meet, and know Jesus in a different light. So if you read the, the, the book of Luke, it's going to look different than the book of Matthew. It's going to look different than the book of John because Luke is writing as a historian and he wants us to know and meet a historical Jesus that God truly did interact and come in the flesh. And in John, John, the purpose of what John's trying to do is he wants us to know the person of God. John's entire reasoning, everything that he writes is for the purpose that we would know and understand the person of God. That, that it would, he would highlight the Jesus, God who he spent time with, who he fell in love with, that if he would write in such a way that we would understand this Christology, which is just an academic word with knowing the person of Christ, the theology, the makeup of God incarnate, that we would understand who God is in the flesh as Jesus, but also that we would come to know the personality of God because John interacted with Jesus himself. He was one of the disciples. It's why he would even put words in his gospel of the disciple that Jesus loved because he wants you to know that the personality of God, this person that, that John fell deeply in love with, with his God, God that he got to know and that we would fall in love with him too, that we would understand who he is, his likes, grow in understanding who God is, but the person and that we might fall in love too. Here at Story City, we, we use language that says your story is welcome here, that your story matters to God. And so in a lens and in a sense, as we read through John, this is John's story. John is sharing this Jesus who he knows and his desire and hope is if we can just enter into his story to hear how he sees him, that we too might as an avenue be able to get to know God and know Jesus, and know the depth and love, the depth and restoration of Christ. So it's not just the context of why John wrote this that brings light to what we're trying to do and attempt and accomplish in the next few weeks, but also there's context to the specific verses that we read today about the, the temple, what's happening with Jesus at the time of Passover, uh, and that helps us even understand a little bit more. Okay, so if, if John is trying to get us to know the person of Jesus, so if what we're doing this morning is trying to look at this text and go, how does this reveal about the person of Jesus? Helping to know a little bit more of the context of what's happening in this scene can help us. So the context of this passage is about revealing who Jesus is and what matters to him. Jesus comes to the temple to worship, and, and he's gathering as it's a holy season of Passover. 
which means that people are coming from all over the world, all over the countryside to come to the temple to worship God. And they're planning to make sacrifices for the remissions of their sins. So in temple worship, they come to, to repent and to do that. They would, they would go through a ceremonial process where they would bring an ox, a sheep, a dove, and, and, the, and there would be a process of casting upon their sins upon the animal. And there would be a sacrifice to appease the fact that all sin leads to death. And so this is why we see merchants in the temple, which is actually, there's four courts to the temple, like layers. This is happening in the outer courts, which is called the court of the Gentiles. So this is a space that women and men from any, any, any religion, any ethnicity can come and gather is in the court of the Gentiles. And so when, when, when the scene hits, there's a reason why there's actually merchants selling oxen and sheep and dove. It's because it's actually there for a reason. It's so that people who do not have means, people who were unable to bring a, a suitable sacrifice could count on the fact that when they arrived to the temple, that they could purchase a suitable sacrifice for their family. But there's a turn that happens here because it, it, what started out as something that was good, let's, let us help the people encounter God and let's, let's bring them closer to God. What started as something to serve the people began to, to line their pockets. And they began to be able to, to upcharge some of the sacrifices because it was needed. So now the merchants are making profit. They're making money off, off of selling their sheep. But also because people are coming from all over the world where there's different money being exchanged, they have money changers there too. And if anybody's traveled, maybe you've had to do an exchange and have, have an exchange rate and pr pay a price for that. That's exactly what's happening. So the money changers are also making profit. What was meant to serve the church, serve God's people, serve even people who didn't know the, the Yahweh God, who are coming to participate in hopes of meeting this high God of Israel, are now being taken advantage of. So Jesus walks into the courts, he sees this happen, and we see the scene ensue. So when we look at this, it's important to understand the context of what's happening because, again, I, I believe that if John is writing for us to understand the person of God and what really matters to him in this scene, then it's not necessarily about <coughs> the anger that God has. Maybe you look at this and go, that's weird. God seems a little angry here. Maybe you've heard this preached before about the anger of God and turning over tables and how it teaches about righteous anger. Do I think that that's wrong to take that approach? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't. I think there's an aspect of that. But I think it's deeper than this. And as we read that passage earlier, it kind of comes to a crux in verse 17, where it says, the zeal for the house of the Lord consumed me. The disciples remembered what was happening in Jesus in that moment, as he makes a cord and a whip, as he's overturning tables, they remember the, the, the words of prophets <laughs> that says, zeal for the house of Lord consumed him. And so I believe that this is what the motive, this is what, what John is trying to get us to see, is that there's this zeal that is consuming Jesus. So this isn't necessarily about anger or even for Christians how to have righteous anger. This is about Jesus, God, was consumed by a zeal. He, even before we get to what he was consumed by, God was consumed. That should put a halt, a pause in our life. If this high God, if this God who we want to imitate, this God that we want to get to know, this God that we want to love is consumed by something, would it not cause a pause for us to go, I, I need to know. Man, I hope that I can be consumed by, by this thing as well. Appreciate it, Jared that I can be consumed by this thing as well. How do I get consumed? I, if anything, not just for replication, but just so that I can know God. God, what consumes you? And it's the zeal for the house of God. Consumed is this word, katisteo. Katisteo, it's the, it's the Greek word for consumed. And what it means is to literally be devoured by to be devoured by. So, so Jesus is being devoured by zeal. 
And, and I understand zeal isn't necessarily a word that we use that often. Sometimes we might say someone was zealous for something, right? Maybe practically, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're different than me and you go around using the word zeal all the time. I don't know. I, I'm not that guy, okay? Um, so I need to do just a little bit more work. What is this word zeal? What does it really mean? And zeal really means a passion. Zeal directly translates as passion, but it's, but it's more than just a feeling of passion. So maybe that's what comes to your mind, like someone's passionate about something, but it's more than just passion. It's passion enacted. It is passion that propels. Passion on mission. It, it's something that moves. So it's kind of like to say, and I've I've shared this before. It's like looking. It's like looking at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. And for so long, people have looked at this passage and they're like, so is love an emotion or is love an action? And there's been debates and all these different things. But like a good moderate, I just say, I think it's both. I think it's both. Because I truly do, you know, because we see, we see in other passages like James, like, uh, is, it, is it faith by works? Is it, is, it, is it by works or is it by grace? Like, what is it? And it's this, this meshing of two things that I think are divinely orchestrated, almost like the incarnation. Is he God or is he man? It's divinely both. And this passion and this zeal that we see, it's not just that that Jesus is overwhelmed, that there's this zealousness of emotion that rises up in him as if he is reacting from this place. No, it's this merging of two. It's as if God, even in John 3, 16, (coughs) was to say that there was an emotion, that there was this action that, that moves him forward, that it's not necessarily because of love that he has to send. It's not because of sin that builds this love. It's a merging of these two things. It's as if to say that Jesus is consumed by a passion for God's house and that this zeal and passion, this burden that, that compels one to move or it's a truth so profound that it sends one into action and discovers new depths of love along the process. This house that Jesus said in Luke chapter (laughs) 2, when his parents and his whole family are going to to the temple, when he's a young boy, a young teenager, and his whole family is going for another holiday to the temple, and and then we see this scene where they, they do the festivals, and then they go and leave. And some time after they left, the parents look back and they said, where's baby Jesus? Where'd my, where'd my teenager go? And so they have to double back to the temple. Maybe some of you guys know this scene. The, the, the mom shows up and it's a question of like, what are you doing here? And what's Jesus' response? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? You see, it lends perspective to why there is a zeal, why there's a passion, why Jesus would be consumed. This is his father's house. This is a place of worship. This house is the place where God meets humanity. I mean, from the Old Testament, this is the place where the Ark of the Covenant, the place where where anyone can come and worship in the presence of God. It's where the Holy of Holies is. It's where sacrifices can be done. This is the epitome of God on earth. And so this, this, not just for what it means and this zeal and this passion being devoured and consumed by the, by what he sees in this temple of what ought to be. And this drives us to our, to our big idea for this morning. If we truly want to dive in and if we want to see who Jesus is and we want to be consumed by the things that consume him, our big idea, if you remember nothing else from this morning, I want you to remember this. If you don't take any other notes, I would ask that you would write this down for yourself to come back to. The big idea is be consumed with what consumed Jesus. Listen, there's a lot of people in this room A lot of people that have come from different walks of life that are in different paths in their journey for Christ. Maybe this morning you came just in questioning and discovery. Who is God? Maybe you wouldn't say that that you're there yet. Maybe you're even coming in protest. But you're here this morning just trying to see what Jesus is about. Maybe maybe you come this morning, you have a lot of questions. You're on the beginning stages and you're just in hope trying to find God and deeper meaning. Maybe for some of you, you've been a disciple of Jesus for a long time. Church is your background and you would say you have a strong faith. I I say that this is for everybody. 
that if we, if, if this truth of who Jesus is, Jesus is God, he has called us in pursuit of him, that God truly does have an identity and a purpose in our life, and we are to be redeemed and become back as children of God into relationship with him. If this is true, then it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, we ought to be consumed by what consumed Jesus. Our hearts should match God's heart, the things that he cares about, that he loves. This is what John is trying to lead us to. The purpose of this, of just displaying God's, Jesus' presence at this temple is to reveal he's consumed by something. Would we not be consumed too? Be consumed with what consumed Jesus. And I don't want us to get confused because a classical approach to trying to become consumed by what consumed Jesus is to try and get this old catchphrase, the WWJD. What would Jesus do? An old classical approach would be to try and focus in on and say, how do I replicate the, hit Jesus's outcomes? Because that's really what it means. What would Jesus do? How do I, how do, I do the result that Jesus did? And I would challenge and say, I think a better question to be consumed by the things that consume Jesus is actually something different by asking the question, how would Jesus live his life? How would Jesus live? It's HWJL, not catchy. It will never catch on. I understand that. WWJD is way cooler, way more easy. Prince easier on bracelets. But I do think holistically, we, ha- we, we actually ought to be asking ourselves, how would Jesus live? So that we're pursuing the holistic approach of who is Jesus and not just what were the outcomes of Jesus. It- it's as if you're teaching a young child to play baseball and you're telling the child, okay, well, let's, let's try and explain what is the concept of baseball? How do you win? You score more points. What's the fastest way to score more, more points? Blast the ball over the, over the fence. And if you were to try and teach a child, okay, the game of baseball, just knock home runs, right? And some of us, some of us are attempting to do that in our spiritual walk. If we look at how do I just replicate God? We show up to church once a week and we're just trying to knock home runs. We're showing up on Sunday morning, go, oh, John 2, and we're trying to crash course it, right? Right before service. Hey, hey, nothing wrong with that. All right, I'm just saying. But, but. If we're just trying to replicate these things, we're showing up and we're just trying to knock things out of the park. Or when you hit a trial or something hard in your life, you're trying to react and just hit things out of the park. When realistically, if you're trying to teach somebody a new trade, a new trait, you're not telling them just, hey, swing for the fences. You're teaching them the mechanics of how to have a proper swing. And sometimes when you make connection, that ball's going over the fence. But more often than not, it's actually a game. It's a life of baseball. In the same way for the Christian, there's a lot of us that are reacting and just trying to knock things out of the park. We're getting up to situations. We're swinging with all of our might. There's a lot of misses. Sometimes we connect and we're just swinging away. When really what the desire of God in our life is, if we would just focus on the mechanics, if we would be consumed by what consumed Jesus, if we would match our life by what matched Jesus' life, then we would actually begin to have the results that Jesus had. Not because he was able to accomplish results, but because he lived a life that had results. So we are invited to come follow him and to live in his ways. If we could just consume ourselves to be consumed with what consumed Jesus. And if we were to do this, what does it look like? What does it mean to be consumed with what consumed Jesus? It brings us to our first fill-in. We must be consumed by a passion for God's house. We must be. We read in this passage that there's zeal for the house of God consumed him. Then we too ought to be consumed by a passion for God's house. It begs the question, what is God's house? Well, John 2, continuing in our, in, our, in our scripture from this morning, John chapter 2, uh, starting in verses 18 through 22. Let me, just, let me just read this for us. So the Jews replied to him, what sign, what sign will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. 
So when he raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the statement Jesus had made. So, so what is the temple that Jesus is speaking about? It's about the body. Why? Why is it about his body? Because like I mentioned in the Old Testament, it was about God's manifestation on earth. Well, in the incarnation, when God put on flesh, what is God's manifestation on earth? It's Jesus. And so if we follow this, we have to look at where, where scripture, scripture leads us. And the truth of the matter is, make no mistake, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have committed your life to him, you are the house of God. You are the temple of God. The triune God resides within you. It is now manifested in the believer 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Everyone say, you are that temple. You are that temple. God's manifestation on earth, God's dwelling place on earth is in the believer of Jesus. You see, God desires all of us. God does not want us to divide our house. He walks in, Jesus walks in in our scene and he sees God's house and it's a house divided. He sees a house where merchants have set up and are taking advantage. It's not, it's not exalting. It's not directly praising God. And so there is a zeal for the house that rise up. This is my father's house. And so if we could just be consumed for a moment to look internal, to look at our life and to be not divided, but to look at the father's house and say, God, how do I praise and worship? How do I get a zeal for this house to pursue you and to not allow distractions, to not allow things to get in the way, to be undivided and worship to you in this temple, in this place? See, merchants and thieves had perverted the, and invaded the temple but it didn't start out as a direct affront. It started from a good place to provide need for others. And as we were in sermon prep this last week, Pastor Jared said something really great and I loved it. And he said, what started out as a ministry, what started out to provide for others in the hearts of man, the business became more important than the ministry. And I look to ourselves in the, in the grind of the day to day, and the things that we accumulate and the things that aren't necessarily evil or bad, things that maybe we say uh, bring joy to our lives in the business of our own life, how many things, how, how many times has business overridden our ministry? Because the truth is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we know and we understand for anybody who has received the ministry of reconciliation, they have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are all, anyone who has a relationship with Jesus Christ is given the ministry of reconciliation to be ambassadors for God on earth. And so there is a ministry in this house of God. There is a ministry to be done. And I wonder where has business become greater than the ministry in our life? And make no mistake, friends, that this world, all the different brands and companies that are out there, they know this about you. They know this about us, that we are temples. And what they're trying to do is set up tables in our courtyards. They're trying to get us to be brand ambassadors for their companies. Listen, if any of you are in marketing, if any of you are in business, you, or if, you're, if you just pay attention to business strategies, you know how much business has, has transformed. They've learned a lot. Because it's no longer, the marketing is no longer about about consuming, trying to build consumers. It's no longer about just buy this product. It's deeper than that. It's why commercials have changed, advertisements have changed, because it's not so much about consume the product. It's about how do we build brand ambassadors? How do we get people to love a product that builds a culture that they actually go out and advertise for us? So make no mistake, it, it, the, the world is, is fighting to set up shop 
in your temple. So we have to, if we're going to be consumed with what consumed Jesus, then we have to be consumed by a passion for God's house. It has to matter that, that if we are consumed by a zeal for this house, this flesh, this body, this heart, does it worship God undivided? I, I, it leads me to ask a question of us, myself included. Even as I was preparing for this message, I was doing deep internal work on this. So I invite and include you into even what I have been processing to ask a simple question. If God was enter, to enter into our temple, into our inner hearts, what tables would he see set up? And what tables would he be filled by zeal, consumed and devoured to start flipping tables out and driving them out? Not out of anger, not out of this place, but out of a zeal of what ought to be to, to, to say, this does not belong in, my, in the Father's house. And I, and I hate to see my temple divided. And I want to see this precious temple in, in, to know the ultimate relationship of the Father. What tables would, would he begin to overturn in our inner hearts and in our inner lives? I just want to say, I want to encourage you, if there was something that first came up for you, I would encourage you to write it down. Somewhere, you know, safe for you to be able to meditate on this week. A lot of times there's a temptation as things like this get spoken, something comes up, and then we start going down the train of thought. But usually that first thing is something that's big for us. And so I would just ask, capture that. Don't move on from that. I would encourage you to meditate on that this week. I'm not saying that that thing is the thing. I'm not speaking for God on that. What I am encouraging you on is to capture it and pray about it. And, and anything else that got brought up that stirred inside of you. And, and I understand, and there's a, there's a tight rope on this to walk because because I, you need, I'm not trying to get us to a point of perfectionism. I'm not trying to get us to a point of, of having to replicate and do. So uh, there's a tightrope in this to understand. I have to meet God with God's heart in this. Okay, there's a tightrope of, here, here's the best way to put it. When Jesus showed up to the temple and he saw what was happening in the temple, it didn't say that God hated the temple. It didn't say that Jesus hated the temple. It didn't say that, that Jesus rejected the temple. He was so filled, he entered the temple. So do not get confused. If you're anything like me, even asking that question, stirs up some stuff inside. It makes me wonder, God, am I even worthy? Am I even good enough for you? Would you even want to be in this temple? Yes, he would. And yes, he does. He wants to set up house. He wants it to be all about him. Jesus did not reject the temple. He entered into the temple. And Jesus wants to enter into your heart and soul and your mind. And he wants to be everything to you. So do not hear any type of deceit or a lie from the enemy that would say your temple is unworthy of him. Because God loves you and he wants to set up in your life and be your God. But if we are going to be consumed by the heart and the zeal and the passion, if we're going to be consumed with what consumed God, we have to ask ourselves the hard heart questions because it means being having a passion for God's house. So allow us to be a people that is consumed for a heart for God's house. If we were to take it further and, and we're trying to, trying to be consumed by that, with, that consumes Jesus. If we know that that means that we must be consumed by a passion for God's house, it also means that we must be consumed by a passion for others. This is the second point, second write in. We must be consumed by a passion for others. Some of you may remember uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, giving a sermon about the roadmap of Jesus and how he talks about the temple. Things like in Exodus 19.6, Isaiah 49.6, John 1.4, Matthew 5.14, 1 Peter 2.9. From the very beginning, there's a roadmap through the gospel that was always God's chosen people. The place where God would dwell and set up temple was not just for the Israelites. It was for the nations. It was for all people. In that same way, one of the hardest rebukes that Jesus came to give the religious leaders was that they had turned from a here, they became a here I am nation. A nation that was consumed with, you have to come here, and you have to come to us, and you have to come through us 
to meet God. And one of the radical things that Jesus did was taking a nation, taking a people group from a place of here I am to there you are. A place of people on mission to look outside of themselves, outside of the temple courts, because the temple was always meant for the Gentiles. Where was, where was the, 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 the scene that Jesus comes to the temple? Where was this taking place? In the court of the Gentiles. In, in the court of the Gentiles. This was a place for people of all backgrounds to come and meet the God of Israel. The light on the hill that should not be covered. And, and the religious people of the day were getting in the way of the ministry and hindering people to come to know God. In that same way for us, if we are going to be consumed for the house of God, let us make no mistake, it's not just an internal struggle. It's not just about trying to manifest a perfect body, a perfect temple. It's to be external. It's supposed to be a place where the temple of God enters into the world. And so if we are going to be a people consumed by that which consumed Jesus, then we too, in our inner courses, we're building up. It's not to be holier than holy so we can say, look at me and how holy I am. It's to be a light into the world. It's to draw people into God. I don't know if, if you've ever met somebody who, who like just exudes Jesus, somebody who, who you can just tell, man, this person's consumed by God. I don't know if you've ever experienced that where someone's just so contagious, the conversations, you're just like, God, I feel like I just walked away and got to meet a piece of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever met somebody, everybody comes to mind. For me, I think of John Harrett. I love that man. And I am so blessed to, to live next door to that guy because the dude's just walking around and he's just speaking scripture out loud, singing worship songs. And then Jesus, and then, and then my son, Nolan is just like learning worship songs. Cause he's like, he's like, John, John, he loves John's voice. And in any conversation you get to have with the guy, it's just like, he's drawing you into the presence of Jesus. And I can't wait for him to come home. <laughs> I know Leah, you, you, you can't wait more, <laughs> but I can't wait to have him home. I can't wait because I feel like I'm missing a piece of Jesus. I, this, this is just a taste for us to be consumed by God, that others, as they interact with us, as they get to spend time with us, there's a glimpse of, I feel like I just got a piece of Jesus because that person's so consumed. Why? Because it's for others. It's for others. It takes us from a here I am to a there you are. In our hearts, we have to look at, at what did God, what did Jesus put himself around? What does it mean to be consumed with that which has consumed Jesus? To be consumed by a passion for how, the house of God. To be consumed by a passion for others. How do we go from this place to, 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 to actually living this out for others? It, take, it takes us from a place of walking into church and just trying to sit in the seat that we sat in last week into a place of, of looking externally and outwardly and going, who, who have I not met? Who have I not connected to? And how do I sit with them? How do I make sure that no one comes into this church and is alone in a service? It, it, it's sitting in service and not just being consumed by the thought of, man, I wonder where I'm going to eat today after service. And being consumed with, who am I going to connect with? Who am I taking with me? Who's come, who, who can I do life with? It's being consumed by the thoughts and the ideas of, of not just, just going, where do I feel like I should eat today? But where am I making a mark? Maybe it's a commitment to go to the same restaurant, to love on the same wait, waiter, the same waitress, the same server, and just spend time so that they can know, know God more. I'm going to tip well. I'm going to show them the love and kindness of God. It's in our daily lives and entering into a space. If we are the temple of God, into our workspaces, into the grocery lines, at the lines of getting gas, it's entering into space to make it a holy space because realizing and truly knowing that this is the temple of God, God's manifestation on earth is where I go, creating the courts of people to be able to come and know the, the high God. And if they can know that, that we love them, then, then, then maybe they can know that God loves them too. That, that we would walk in a way of owning what consumed Jesus was a passion for the house of God and others. To love God 
and to love others. It's like Jesus said it himself. So then what do we do and how do we walk from this place? If we want to be consumed by, a, by, by that which consumed Jesus, my, my, I just want to shift into just some practical steps for us. And, and it comes to our third point, our final point as we close out. Be consumed by a passion for how Jesus lived. It brings us right back, not to try and replicate that which Jesus did, but to, to live a life as Jesus lived. Be consumed by a passion, a zeal, all-consuming. Be devoured by the lifestyle of Jesus. Listen, I don't care where you're at in your journey and your walk with Jesus. I want you to know, if you're, if you're new, if you're questioning things, if you're trying to figure this thing out, don't just try and match what you think Christian culture is. I want, I want to encourage you to be consumed with the life that Jesus lived. To the believer, to the disciple who's been doing this Jesus thing for a long time, be consumed with the life that Jesus lived. It doesn't matter where we're at. This should, we should be devoured by his lifestyle. Dallas Willard, in his book, Spirit of the Disciplines, says it like this, true Christ-likeness, true companionship with Christ comes at the point where it is hard not to respond as Jesus would. That if we can match our life, if we are true companions of Jesus, if we are living the way that Jesus lived, it's not about trying to replicate and do, it's about responding. If we could just live close to him, we would begin to respond the way that Jesus did. So what does this mean? Because it's going to take sacrifice. It means, it means doing some hard work of turning over some tables. It means doing some hard work of, uh, of figuring out priorities. And there's going to be things that are uncomfortable. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice. And it's going to take a lot of time because we're not just emptying things. We're filling things. We're building new rhythms. We're, we're building new patterns. We're building new disciplines in our life. And it's going to be hard. It's, it's kind of like, I think it's the reason why Jesus say, if anybody wishes to come after me, if anybody wishes to follow, follow me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. It starts with a denial of self so that we can get rid of these, these additional things and focus solely on God and being filled by him. So where does this come in? Well, you got to spend time with Jesus. I would encourage all of you to get, to get connected with God regularly. I don't know what regularly looks like for you. Uh, like, we're all in different patterns. I would like, to, I would like that there's, Jesus show, demonstrated a daily rhythm of getting alone with God and praying with him. I think there's a place to be devoured and consumed by a desire to, to, to be in the presence of God daily. But again, it's just like practice, just like rhythms. We all have to start somewhere. And so just be real. I mean, I would encourage all of you to sit through this and wrestle. What does it look like for me? Maybe on the back of your, of your notes this morning, it's kind of creating a plan of what are the next steps for me? What does it mean for me to be in the presence of God regularly? I would also encourage you to get into the, into the word of God regularly, not just in some time of prayer, but to get into the word of God regularly, to see the, the life of Jesus that we could be consumed, that we would literally consume the word of God, that we would devour the word of God the life of Jesus, that we wouldn't approach the Bible of just going, what did Jesus do and how do I do what Jesus did? But we look at the life of Jesus and say, how do I, how do I mimic this life that Jesus had? It, it takes us from a place of not going to scripture and saying, how do I go through the scripture, but asking, how do I let the scripture go through me? It's, it's walking, consuming and being devoured by the word of God. Uh, it looks like doing, doing additional learning, adding something, going deeper in our life, mining for more, doing some extra learning. Maybe that looks like, like reading a book, listening to some podcasts, or just doing some additional learning on top of spending time with God through prayer, spending time with God through the word, but, but allowing ourselves to go deeper and study. To, when I do marriage counseling, whether it's premarital counseling or while people are, are trying to refine their marriage, one of, the, one of the base things for everybody, no matter where they're at in their relationship, I always tell them, become a student. Become a student of your partner. 
Become a student of relationships. Never stop learning about your partner. Never stop learning about communication habits. Never, learn, never stop learning about what it means to sacrifice. Be a, be a lifetime pursuit of being a student of your partner and of relationships. In the same way, I would encourage you because Jesus is the most important relationship that we could ever have. Be a student of Jesus and be a student of what it means to have a relationship with him. So go deeper. And we have things here, uh, right now media, it's a free gift to you. It's a, it's a spot that if you don't know where else to go into, your, into some deeper learning, just sign up for it. It's free to you, and it's a huge library of different podcasts, sermons, Bible studies, and, and it's really easy to get to. It's right at the bottom of our website. Just click right now media, you can subscribe. If you don't know anywhere else to go, I'd encourage you to go there. Do some extra learning. Do life with others. We have in our community here at the church, we, we, we call missional communities. Friends, find your people. Do not do Christ alone. Find your people. Join a missional community. And if you don't know where to start, if you don't know where to look, come find me. I'll stand by those double doors at the end of service. I would love to help you find a missional community. And if you're looking at these, if, you're, if you had a hard time today, if you're just internally looking at these tables, and, and here's the thing. I know that typically for us, as we, as we think about the tables that need to be turned over, a, a, a first place is sometimes to think of the sin that's in our life. And the truth is that it's more than just sin. It could just be the patterns, the lifestyles, things that we added, things that we have in our life. It's not just sin, but maybe there is something in your life that is really difficult. Maybe for you, uh, 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 an encouragement of turning over tables was actually really hard for you because maybe it brings up some resentment. Justin, you don't know how many times I've tried to flip this table. You don't know how many times I've tried to sacrifice it and bring it to God. It, it constantly is returning. It, or maybe you feel defeated. It's just too big. It's just too big. I don't even know where to start. I want to encourage you, do not try and do this alone. In fact, there's a community dedicated to this space of, of, of recovery, of celebrating recovery, and it's through our CR group. So I just want to, I want to encourage you, if, if you feel like you're in a place of just not knowing where to go or how to do it, and, you're, and, you're, and, it's, and it's a place that's really hard for you, I want to encourage you. Come celebrate recovery with a community because you're not alone in this. But at the end of the day, it starts right here for all of us. It starts with just a, a, a few of us. And if a few of us can get contagious enough, if a few of us can be consumed by that which consumes Jesus, others begin to get encouraged and to begin to want to match and do life with. And so I would just, I would just ask for each person in this room, would you be consumed by that which consumed Jesus? Would you be the one that would light a fire for all of us who want to walk side by side and pursue the same things? If we could just do this together. So let me pray. Let me pray for us that we would be consumed with that which consumed Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, Christ be with us. Christ be before us. Christ be behind us. Christ in us. Christ beneath us. Christ above us. Christ on our left and Christ on our right. Christ when we lay down. Christ when we sit down. Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of us. Christ in the mouth of every person who speaks of us. Christ in the eye that sees us. Christ in the ear that hears us. Let's go and be the church. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Would you guys rise? Let's respond. We've talked about responding all morning. We've talked about the glory of God, the kindness of God. Jesus is enough. And perhaps you're struggling to believe that even now, even encountering his glory, encountering uh, who he is. But Jesus is enough, I assure you. And so let us respond together. You are the word at the beginning 
sing that chorus one more time, church. Sing that chorus one more time. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. Father, we, we thank you for this time and this service. We thank you for the word that's been gone forth today. And we pray that you would bless us as we go our separate ways throughout this week, that we would live in your word, and that we would praise you for all our days, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Resurrection Day. Welcome to Story City Church. My favorite comment this morning, somebody said, I didn't even know you owned a jacket. You could dress up. I, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, do you promise to renounce sin? Satan and his ways of doing things and to follow Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Absolutely. Of course I do. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know, it's a long story, but I can say this much that it was a good day. A guy named Danny kind of stopped me and introduced himself to me. And next thing you know, he introduced to everyone here, which was so uncomfortable. And then I met uh, Jared at a Galaxy game. So then I started coming to the Monday nights, the city life, seeing these wonderful people diving into scripture. And then I went, I think I have to commit myself to God now. I think I'm in the in the time of my life where it's never too late to start something, you know? And um, And I felt very welcome. That's so good. Thank you to everyone involved in making that video, including Steven. Thank you very much. Um, I just have two announcements for y'all. First up, I'll start by saying that at Story City Church, we value kids and the families affected by foster care. So the foster care crisis is prevalent in Southern California because close to 20% of the 400,000 kids in care across the US are concentrated in Los Angeles County. So with that statistic in mind, we want to announce a summer mission opportunity taking place in July, you may have heard of it, Royal Family Kids Camp. Yeah. It's a really cool organization and it's a five day overnight camp designed for the unique needs of children in foster care. So kids in the system often experience loss and relational trauma and camp gives these kids a much needed break from the dynamic of constant change and uncertainty and allows them to just let loose and just be kids while learning that they have a father in heaven who loves them. So in order for the camp to support having up to 30 kids in attendance, 
there needs to be 60 plus adult volunteers. So, so far we have about a third of the volunteers needed for July. So we wanted to say, even if you don't have experience, a support role could be the perfect segue into serving in this capacity, especially if you're feeling, you know, maybe a nudge, maybe a Holy Spirit nudge to check this out. Um, it is an intensive volunteer opportunity, but an extremely important one as 